Hello and welcome to, well, a sort of comment response, sort of not comment response video. Because this is Grass Zeppelin, Keyship Series 2, Episode 1 Plus. And this is going to be coming out, oof, I'll probably put this out Sunday morning. And it's sort of a comment response, but it's also sort of not a comment response. In that, uh, I'm responding to a, a one comment, but I'm also responding to a general thing of what do the British do? And some people have been asking me about this, and I did remember I did a video where I covered extensively what I thought the British would do in terms of Graf Zeppelin if it was in service, but there have been a lot of various discussions, and again, that's in that video, that's in a wider video. There is a link to it down below. I've already posted a link as a comment response to some comments. And I just thought, well, I'll do another short video because then I have a second video I can point to and just go, it's in that video or it's in that video. So this is going to aim to be about 20 minutes long, probably going to be longer because it's me. And it's going to discuss, to an extent, some response to the, some of the comments about the graphs uh, on the graph seven video. But it's also going to be a case of what did the British Royal Navy do? And I'm going to be reusing the slides from the Graf Zeppelin video. One thing I am going to do is I'm going to get the spelling right on this PowerPoint because I did notice after it went out, I got the spelling right the whole way through, but for some reason, I got the spelling wrong on the first page. And I do not know why I hadn't noticed, and I didn't notice in any of the editing or any the whole way through, and suddenly I look at, looked at it on live, uh, when it went alive and was looking at it and going, Oh, frigate. Oh, frigatey frigate. And it was a case of, how the did... I don't know. I do not know. So, let me just save and make sure that's all fixed. Oh, no, I apologize. I spelt it right in every other slide. So, what happened there? I don't know. I honestly don't. Life. Life, life, life. Probably because I presumed I got it right in the first slide. Because, you know, or something like that. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. So I'm just going to apologise for it and make sure you see it has been corrected. So, the graph Zeppelin. Now, I always start videos with a shameless book plug because I am a naval historian and this is currently my only book out. I am working on others, some which are going to be self-published and a couple which may hopefully get publishers interested. But I've got to sort some things out at some points before that can they can come about. I need to... Honestly, I need to get further along this path of Divert, uh, changing my income streams and changing the way I fund my work before I can really launch into those. So, William, and this is a response in part to William's many, many comments, because William did a whole load of them at ZK, and they were very interesting comments, and I was reading them, but I wanted to talk, uh, discuss them with you. Um, I was kind of I would have to say slightly disquieted by some of the opening line because if you're starting off with most of what is disparagingly written about the Graf Zeppelin is nonsense by supercilious, lazy, ignorant faux historians who haven't studied the matter. The phrase I would use is people who, have, uh, people who are uninformed and don't understand the full context. Um... I, I think once you're starting the point of being rude about people, that detracts from your whole point. And honestly, if it hadn't been for the quality in your other comments, I might well not have read further beyond there. Because honestly, my first thing, whenever I see people starting to be insulting or rude about other people, even if they do disagree with them, because you might have noticed my own style is always to try and be polite about people. Even if I disagree with them, I try and be polite and respectful, because I always presume it's uh, I always presume it's a lack of information 
rather than a lack of passion or honour on their part, which might lead to ill-informed comments. The Jap uh, okay, but then unfortunately you then say the Japanese had no suitable practical experience, nor did the USN, in the types of operations the Germans would need to do in enclosed water and narrow channels whilst being attacked by onrushing destroyers. Okay, for starters, why are you in enclosed water and narrow channels of an aircraft carrier? I know you're bringing up the Baltic operations, but the carrier was not being built on the German strategy for really for Baltic operations. If it was used in Baltic, then it was going in a Baltic operation. It was supposed to be kept back behind destroyers and behind cruisers. Again, as part of a task group, the German operations and plan for it is very similar to the British. It is supposed to be part of a task group. So again, if you're being attacked by onrushing destroyers in confined waters, a lot has gone wrong. Now, I can understand you wanting to ensure and put some protection in there against things going wrong, but when that becomes a primary factor of your design considerations, you have issues. That should not be, that should be a, okay, in case of worst case scenario, what do we have that can help us in this scenario? Not a, this is a primary factor that this might happen in our design plan. And it wasn't supposed to be. One of the things I point out in the video, and I pointed out in discussions, and I've got this from many German sources and many good sources on it, is the fact that the original designer had half the guns that they were ended up planning on fitting on. And still, casemate weapons I'm not particularly keen on, but I can justify necessarily half the guns. But the whole thing is, the guns get doubled by people misreading the plans, and no one can correct it back to what was originally planned, so then you're dealing with double the guns. At that point, there's a problem. At that point, and it... For aircraft operations, and for operating as a carrier, those guns are such a... If this goes wrong, if this goes wrong, if this goes wrong, if this goes wrong, that's a necessary scenario. You have to look at what else is being done. The Royal Navy was no better, really. No, the Royal Navy's plan for confined operations was carrier keep out of confined waters, provide air support from the, from respectable distance, while nasty, mean destroyers, a.k.a. tribal class, and other destroyers, a.k.a. all of the pre-1930s destroyers, the other side destroyers, go in and kill them off. Uh, that's basically the Royal Navy's plan for confined waters is what HMS Warspite and destroyers and the tribals and the other destroyers get up to at Narvik. And there were, should have been a carrier sitting off it. In fact, there sort of is, depending on where you put the carrier. Um, IGN experience of the expanse of the Pacific and Ocean, named after a relatively peaceful nature, was the same as the USN. Yeah, that's lovely, but again, the Royal Navy... That, that just because they're operating in the Pacific and you're thinking about the Pacific waters, that the Pacific in its centre uh, is very, very lovely and nice and passive. But when you sort of, in comparison to the North Atlantic, etc. But when you're going into the high north and some of the waters, the Japanese do operate in them as do the Americans. And that doesn't, in a nicest way, that doesn't provide non-relevant carry operations experience. Okay, it's still useful. It's still something to build upon. And then you go into the compress uh, uh, your points. Okay, one, the compressed air trolley system was able to launch aircraft without the aircraft carrier turning into the wind, as USN, RNIJ, and carriers had to do. They had to do for fully loaded aircraft. Several of them could launch without going into the wind because they had their own catapult systems, which could launch those aircraft fine without turning into the wind. Um, and the Royal Navy systems are called accelerators because catapults are what you fit onto ships like cruisers and capital ships, mainly battleships, but let's be honest, some battle cruisers in the Royal Navy as well, that launch aircraft in those circumstances. Uh, they're called accelerators in the Royal Navy. They don't need to turn into the wind to launch all the aircraft. And Honestly, the ones they do tend to launch is if they're launching a full carrier strike and they want to learn, uh, launch aircraft which are fully laden with all the heavy weighty stuff. And especially as aircraft go up in weight during World War II, it takes time to improve and put in new accelerators. So sometimes it's easier to just turn into the wind or turn a point into the wind. But also you're going at full speed so you've got wind over the deck. 
Um, a good example of the fact that they need to, uh, them turning into wind usually is given as escort carriers, which of course have far less facilities and are capable of far less higher speeds than a full fleet carrier. And that's part of the scenario of what you have to balance when you're talking about procuring a fleet versus an escort carrier, etc. The, the relative capabilities of it to need to turn into wind to not turn into the wind. A German aircraft carrier will need to operate in the enclosed waters of the Baltic. Navigate past the narrows around Denmark, through the North Sea, or out through the English Channel, and there was no space or time to head into the wind. I don't think any point the Germans were planning on sending a carrier through the English Channel. That's not really a good idea. I know the the Germans do manage to do it once, but as we've been, I've been over a few times over the scenario of the uh, Channel Dash, the fact is there was a complete breakdown in British command structure, which there shouldn't have been. And if the command structure had worked properly, had informed the people of why they were doing the scouting missions, why they were there on duty, why it was important to keep watch in case of ships coming up so they could be properly alerted, so they could properly function a strike, that wouldn't have worked. And it wouldn't have worked afterwards because after it happened, they shut the door. And to be fair, some of the patrols are submarine-based as well on the ones which are watching Germany. And they certainly know what's coming out for them. So it would go through the North Sea. Um, navigate the Arizona and Denmark. No, that's what the Kiel Canal is for. They're, why would you risk your carrier in the open water in confined spaces? No. As for fighting the Baltic again, you would put cruisers, you put destroyers in front of it, and you would keep the carrier back. And preferably you don't want to operate the carrier in the Baltic. Most of the uh, things you need to do can be done from land-based air in Baltic space when you're the uh, in sort of the Germans. When you're moving forward, if you're planning on offensive operations and going up to the high Baltic, uh, sort of Sweden area, and sort of the, the area around, um, around St. Petersburg, Yes, then you can bring in a carrier, but then you've got a lot of space of water behind you. So you've got a lot of space you can operate the carrier in, but that's not really what the carrier is for. And when you look at the German plans for the carrier, it's not planned for the Baltic. It's planned around North Atlantic, mainly North, North Sea, of course, to get there, but North Atlantic is its main area of operations, and that's where they're mainly envisaging their task force working in. Um, so, yes, and then you've... But again, the German destroyer would be likely subject to rush on rushing destroyers to be able to defend itself with power guns that outrange the destroyers. Yeah, the trouble is, if it's in a scenario where it's on rushing destroyers, and it's in rough waters, where those forward casemate guns are most likely not going to work, in according to its own designer, that's not going to help them. And if those guns aren't working, then they're just dead weight. Um, the, it's free. The aircraft carrier needs some armor so it could absorb some damage without having to abandon its mission. Again, that's the same as the Royal Navy, and I fully agree. I don't think at any point did I critique it having armor. Having armor is viable. The British have the armored carriers. You know, that's... If you consider, again, this is why I did bring a lot of comparison to the illustrious class. It's because the British are designing those around the idea of operating in the Mediterranean and South China Sea. And that's where they think they're going to be in range of air, enemy aircraft. And so, that, therefore, keeping proximity with the fleet, and so they're going to be more likely to be found by enemy aircraft, and they're going to be operating in the South China Sea to under position up to Japan, because that was the where the British would be working up from. They, you know, work around from Singapore up the South China Sea, and up the coast, probably taking bases along the way, uh, to get closer to Japan to impose the blockade. That was the British plan for war in the Far East. Uh, the Mediterranean scenario, of course, there, there's air threats everywhere. And for the North Sea, etc. Again, air threats everywhere. So you might as well you have a, a reasonable level of protection is perfectly standard in a carrier. And again, that's what the why the illustrious class is a good counterpoint to consider. The compressed air trolley would be able to launch a strike package of twenty four Me one hundred nine Ts and Ju eighty seven torpedo and torpedo and dive bombers with its charge of air. Yes, it would be able to. It would then need a while to recharge. And that strike package is interesting. Uh, it could be effective, it could not be effective, but it's what you're launching. The problem is then it's the time to recharge. But that's a fairly decent strike package for that size of carrier, but it's not that great for that size of carrier, considering it's bigger, heavier, and 
bigger and heavier than HMS Ark Royal was, and it can launch a far smaller strike. It's it's a bit worrying. The Fiesler FI-167 FI, uh, biplane torpedo, biplane torpedo dive bombs had such low flying speed they could launch without a compressed air troll or a In theory, uh, in practice, when fully laden, it's going to be more difficult. But that's, again, like the Swordfish. Uh, you might have seen development of some sort of rocket takeoff assisting system like you had with the, uh, with the um, Swordfish. Could have been an option. Uh... This was the German Navy's first aircraft carrier, so there was some learning involved. Yes, and I, again, I did put that in the original video. The German mail aircraft of four engines and 44,000 pound weight had been launched by aircraft press air. It had some complexity, such as a trolley to return, but let's not pretend that returning a trolley is an impossible difficult task. I don't think it said it was an impossible difficult task. I said it was going to be a very interesting task to keep doing at sea in the salt water with the movement of the aircraft and the movement of the ship and everything else going on. It's, the thing is, it's not an impossibly difficult task. And all these things, and I did try and emphasize this in the video about the Graf Zeppelin. These are engineeringly perfect solutions. The trouble is, they are not, and I mean this in the nicest way, they are not necessarily the most practical solutions for at sea operations. And by that, I do sincerely mean the fact that all these things are going to require a lot of maintenance to keep them running properly. They are not impossible, but the amount of wear and tear you're going to put them through, combined with the motion of the ship, combined with the motion of the sea, and everything that's going on around it, is going to subject them to even more wear and tear. So. The example I give is that on some of their own capital ships, uh, some of their own cruisers, when they went out with scouting aircraft, sometimes they were not able to use the scouting aircraft because the scouting aircraft broke. But sometimes they were not able to use the aircraft because the very mechanism they were using for supporting the scouting aircraft broke. And yeah, they would do their best to repair it, and yes, yeah, sometimes they'd get it working again, sometimes they wouldn't. This, but this happens with British ships as well. And the British ships have a simpler and easier to repair system. It's not as good in terms of engineering because it can't launch an aircraft as powerfully as all, all these sort of things. But it's easier it's easier to repair. And the British system kept it going. I think it's also worthwhile thinking about what the German task force structure would have been like. I foresee myself, and when I've discussed it very often, I would say you would have something like a Bismarck or an H-Class. You would have a Scharnhorst, possibly. I would think you would have at least two capital ships with the carrier. I think you would have a cruiser with the carrier. I think you would have some destroyers with the carrier. And I think that would be a wider task force. That would be deployed in operations. I do not see the Germans, from their own writings on the subject... And from their own standing on the project, sending out a carrier on its own. And again, yes, you can make the uh, you have made the case for the guns being necessary for the Baltic mission. I would agree. Some guns and the the four and a half inch guns on the illustrious class are dual purpose, as are the guns on the Ark Royal. But the point is, those aren't casemated guns. And they aren't casemated because it's realised that casemated guns on a carrier, with the motions of a carrier and the other kind of waters the British are looking at operating in the North Atlantic, the casemated guns don't work. Why did the British not go like casemated guns? Because one of their carriers actually had them. If you look at some of the designs, Hermes, Eagle, etc., they had guns lower down. And the British had slowly been phasing them out and getting replacing with guns higher up on the ship because of that operating in those waters because of operating in those high seas. Now, move on to what is the British response if the Germans have a carrier, if the British ha uh, the Germans have the Graf Zeppelin in service. Well, it depends when it comes to service. There's an interesting debate of 1939 or 1941. I think if it's in service in 1939, well, the British carrier doctrine already at that point is A, multi-carrier operations, and B, to have those ships go around without with capital ship escorts as part of a task force. 
I think you would not... If the Germans have a carrying operation, I do not see courageous being sent off for anti-submarine warfare work because suddenly the priority is going to be different. And that's going to change that. You're going to want more carriers to cover potentially Norway and those sort of operations that can be going on. So no, you won't have a ca uh, won't have one of the fleet carriers dispatched for anti-submarine warfare work. It'll be the escorts will be doing anti-submarine warfare hunting without the carrier support, which is not as effective. But let's be honest, saves us a carrier. I also you have to always remember with the loss of Glorious, that is completely going against British doctrine. The admiral who authorized the carrier to make its own trip back only saved himself because he said, well, according to doctrine, they were supposed to have aircraft in the air at all times providing cover. That's what I presumed they would do. The fact they weren't doing that means that it's on the captain and pushes the blame onto the captain. But under British doctrine, the admiral should not allow the carrier to go off on its own without at least a heavy cruiser or a cruisers as escort as well as the destroyers, which is why I often say, well, actually, it should have been combined with the cruiser bringing, uh, well, with HMS Glasgow, bringing the Norwegian, um, you know, eight, various cruisers around. I think there was Glasgow. There was a, there's a couple other cruisers as well at the time which are sort of in that area. Is Glasgow the one, the one, the one I think of? I'm not looked at the notes for that one, so I apologise if I got it wrong. Uh, but... With the carriers which are around at the time and involved in extra at the cruisers which are around at the time extracting the Royal, uh, Norwegian Royal Family, etc., they should have been combined into a task group heading back. And then there would have been a rear admiral of that task group, and then there certainly would have been aircraft in the air. And that would have changed things dramatically because if Scharnhorst get if if you do have the carrier come back, even if it isn't with at least the cruiser as escort as well as the destroyers. If it's got ca aircraft in the air, the aircraft spots Scharnhorst and Eisenhower a long way away. A, the carrier turns and starts manoeuvring away at high speed. Maybe it B, it maybe it possibly launches a strike. C, it sent a message is sent out alerting capital ships in the area that hang on, there are German capital ships here, which means things like D, renowned, possibly war spite, everything else in that area, cracks on speed at full pace to come south and try and engage them. E, Germans possibly hear the radio signals, think, hang on, we're heading into a hornet's nest here, let's bog off. So, you know, that's the scenario you're sort of talking about. But what happens if you have the Graf Zeppelin out with, let's say, Scharnhorst and Neisenau? Well, that changes things. The British knew Scharnhorst and Neisenau were out. They didn't know where they were, and they thought they were somewhere else. But they didn't know they were out. But if you've got them operating out there, and you know the Germans have a carrier, you're going to have the British forming up Task Force a la Force H, which is a absolute, straight out the book, pre-war Royal Navy concept of carrier operations. You take fast capital ship, A.K. Hood, Renown, Repulse. Add two. Fast Carrier, a.k.a. Arc Royal, a.k.a. Illustrious, a.k.a. Courageous, a.k.a. Glorious. You stick Admiral in charge. Woohoo! You add in Cruiser, preferably Town Class or County Class. In this case, HMS Sheffield was in Force H. And you add in Destroyers. We have Task Group. You go hunt. It is that formulaic and simple. It is literally that formulaic and simple. So, what do I foresee if the Germans do have a task force out with a carrier in them at Nor during Norway? I see the British having two, possibly three, task forces operating out in the same way. Um, probably would be centred on their carriers, so quite possibly Ark Royal, uh, quite possibly Glorious and Courageous. So you're going to have those. What capital ships can you have with them? Well, you've got Warspite thundering around. She could be uh, she could be one of them, but that's going to be a slower group. So that would probably take of the three options probably Courageous, who has some engine issues at this point. Uh, not much, but she's enough that you could probably put her with a capital ship and you'd be happier with, with Warspite. You've then got. Renown's available, so I'm 
thinking Force H, Arc Royal, Renown, uh, because she's the modernized one, and then Hood. So Hood and Glorious, probably on the next option. They would be out well, be out hunting. There would also be some probably some more capital ships as well. But those groups would be providing the formation and forces. You'd have to have about three floated as a destroyers attached to them. Considering the pace of destroyers coming back, you're probably looking at tribal destroyers continuing to do their role, which they did do, of hunting down various enemy groups, groups and providing sweeps. But you'd probably be looking at somewhere in the region of probably a capital ship, a carrier, and a town class cruiser. Considering the options of 12 cruiser squadron, etc., available in the area. And that is what you'd have having around. At any cut time that Graf's Bay, as a Graf Zeppelin is seen, there would be strikes launched. And there would be a carrier battle, problem, possibly. Quite possibly, there would be a carrier battle in Norway. That's in 1949. In 1941, there is a different scenario. Now, I would say I don't see any scenario where the Graf Zeppelin, I think it might cause an upset. It might get a lucky strike. It's got some good aircraft in there, which if the once that strike and we've been over it, it does have a strike of potentially 24 aircraft it can launch using its system. I think that's a fairly decent strike group. I know some have said I know some have said that um, the the ME 109s might not work etc I don't think it matters in terms of I think they would have worked I think it would still have not been necessarily as free of issues as um, something like the Hellcat or Wildcat work, as they were fairly decent, sturdy, reliable aircraft. But I think it would have been better than the Seafire. I'm sorry it would have been, because the Seafire is really, really not good from a leg perspective. But even then, they tend to survive a couple of takeoffs. They, you're looking at them... One of the things that does detract from the Seafire is its use over Salerno and various other places where they're operating on mascot carriers, and which are definitely not the best case scenario, and the pace of operations that they're doing. So that provides less time for preventative and checking maintenance. It provides a more constant strain on the aircraft and on the air crew. All these things cu couple in to make it worse and therefore make an apparent ME109 look worse. And actually, I, I'm not so sure it is does look as bad as that. I... I think it's going to be a very careful aircraft. I think the ME109 would be very capable at dealing with aircraft on a strike inbound. But <clears throat> the thing is, I think, again, you'd have enough aircraft. That, 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 again, it's going to sound strange. The skewers, the sea gladiators, etc. Those are not bad aircraft for doing air defense at sea. Especially not the way the British with radar would be able to utilize them. That is the big thing for me in 1939. In 1941, in terms of air defense at sea, again, you've had things change. You've got the Fulmar, you've got various other aircraft in operations, you've got Albacore coming into, uh, well into service. You've got far more radar available and far more radar search of the British, uh, British Marine aircraft. And I think in 1941, you also have a scenario in that you would be dealing with Bismarck Act. But, and I say this wholeheartedly, one of the things you have to remember in the British calculations of their procurement of ships and in their program, one of the things which is actually attributed by one source to Churchill when he's making decisions on the carrier... He makes the case that they want to continue building carriers, even with the capital ship freeze, because they need a friendly summary warfare. One of the stories which is attributed by only one source, and so I don't use it that often, is he turned around and said, how long till do you think there's going to be a German carrier available? And the Royal Navy went, well, they've got one under construction, but it's been paused for so long, we think it's going to be two to three years. Then we don't need a carrier, because carriers are counter-carriers. If... 
1939 had been a carry available, I doubt, I think he'd have probably kept the carriers building. Because, to an extent, Churchill has a zero-sum mentality. You build carriers to counter carriers, capital ships to counter capital ships, etc, 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 and so on. Um, some respects he doesn't, but some respects he does. In the scenario that we're talking about 1941, I have to Germans have continued on, then she's probably under service before then, she's fully worked up by 1941 and able to go to sea, then you're looking at something which has been in service since 1940, and that means she'd have been far closer in that point even then, and therefore probably you'd have had, not had the pause in carriers, so you probably would have at least another armoured carrier available. At which point Again, it's going to be task forces, it's going to be groups out hunting, and as I've said before, there is a very different battle of Denmark Straits if you have a carrier with Hood and Prince of Wales, as well as a carrier with King George V. There is a very different battle of Denmark Straits if you have different if you have carriers along. You it's a very different battle if you have a carrier with Bismarck and Prince Jürgen. Uh, you would probably have had carrier engagements happening before the fighters would have been engaging each other. You'd also have an interesting scenario, and this is something which I think cannot be overstated. One of the problems the fleet air arm had in justifying themselves getting decent fighters and making a case against the cancelling of the Sea Fire project in 1939 is that everyone was considering their carrier air defence role as against other carrier aircraft. It was a really weird scenario because at the same point as the air ministry was arguing that they needed all the aircraft they could to defend the UK against bombers so the submarine had to concentrate on everything that and that the aircraft were all powerful in attacking ships so therefore you didn't need to focus as much on naval spending they also made the case that only carrier aircraft would fight carrier aircraft, so you didn't need to have high-performance fighters for carriers because you'd only be facing aircraft which would operate from carriers which were automatically lower performance than land-based aircraft. It's a really weird time, and I would like to point out Very, very few people in the air ministry, I think, actually believe that point. And the people who were making it were people who wholeheartedly believed that the only and best way to protect Britain was to maximise the money going into the air ministry to build the forces that they had at their disposal to fight the air war. I think they wholeheartedly believed they were doing what was best for the UK. I don't necessarily agree with all their arguments. But I can see why they made them. I think the argument was actually ultimately won in the case of the Battle of Britain and the Seafar by the fact that Supermarine was just not big enough. And the Shadow Factory program hadn't yet entered its full swing. Well, if I think if it if the Shadow Factory program had managed to enter its full swing and get be under production already and doing as well as it had done, as it was it could do. I think they would have made a different decision in that one. I think so, I think the uh, air ministry might have found they'd lost that argument. But leaving that to one side, 1941, you again up with again task forces, and again it would be operated around carriers, etc. I think you'd also probably have had Force H brought further up, brought up. I think they would have been part of it from the get go earlier on. Uh, so I think Ark Royal would have been come up and been part of it from earlier on. In terms of that scenario, uh, there is a. It would be in a case of there is a group in the uh, in the North Atlantic, heading for the North Atlantic. You are called up into reserve position. You're called. You guys. You are the front carrier groups. You're the reserve one. We've got about three out, and that's another reason why I say, yeah, the the the, the Graf Zeppelin. It would launch its strike. I'm, if it's working, and I think it probably would be at least the first time. I'm not sure if it would be working on day two, but strike one would go off, definitely. And if they've been detected, they could be hit at night. That's the other thing I would point out for the Germans, the night flying operations they don't have. And remember, British doctrine is to try and take out the carrier at night. That is one of the primary things that I'm with 
anti-air surface radar, etc., and all the things they use. That is uh, quite a possibility in 1941, as that's well within the, uh, the powers of the fleet era in 1941 to launch a night strike and take out a carrier. At which point the Germans could have a real issue, because if they've had a night strike... because If the British have invested more in carriers because the Germans have carriers, which they would have done, and when I say this is more than they did originally in terms of inve uh, when, what I mean by investment is actually just not paused to be building, carried on the building of the carriers. They'd have had more carriers available. If they have more carriers available, they launch a night strike. I don't think the Graf Zeppelin survives the night strike. And I don't think, or if it does, I think it's severely damaged. I don't think he, I don't think you're getting out of that night strike without some damage. And uh, considering the far more manoeuvrable Bismarck got caught, I, I the Grau Zeppelin in comparison is not as manoeuvrable. And it's very slab sided for operating in the North Atlantic, so it's not going to be as manoeuvrable. And if it gets hit and damaged, then it becomes a weight around the neck of the rest of the task force, which is going to limit their maneuverability, which is going to be great, because that means things like Rodney, Nelson can get involved in the fight, because they can now catch them up. And if they can catch them up, that's not a good scenario. Because, as we all know, those things are basically floating blocks of steel with 16-inch guns on top. Uh... You can say what you can, whatever you want to say about them. That those things get in range. There isn't much that's surviving. But also, if you've got a fixed group and you're able to launch, you've got two, three carriers of British carriers in the way. The way they can generate their strikes, and the experience they have in generating strikes and the operational capabilities they have, means they can do far. They can launch far more strikes. Um, it's basically it's that old thing it comes down to logistics and size the Germans can build a very engineeringly very interesting vessel as I've said before it's just I think myself they get so enraptured with building and engineeringly perfect and all these ideas are great vessels they forget what it's going to be operating in and the reality is operating in salt water and the maintenance, etc., that's going to require for that to be operating. I think they have some very interesting ideas. One of the things that's come up is a lot of people discussing the octagonal lifts. And, yeah, that does actually theoretically give you some advantages with aircraft movement and aircraft operation. But the thing is, it also gives you dead space you can't really use for other things. Because think about it, if you made a square lift, you'd have an even bigger lift for lifting stuff up, and that's even more, theoretically, more space. You could almost possibly, with the size of the octagonal lifts, if you made them square, you could have possibly increased the number of aircraft the lift could, could, have, could, have, could possibly have brought up. But... You don't have that space, and then you don't have the space down below. It's not a case of it's a wonderful idea for law for being able to bring aircraft off it, but it also creates a lot of dead space you can't really use around it because of its shaping. It's it's a solution to a problem which didn't really need to be solved. It could just have been, yeah, it's fine, a bigger square, That we'll just build a bigger square rather than building an octagonal. But I know where it came from. So ultimately, as I said in the original video, which has gone into all her design and the process, the Graf Zeppelin upsets me most because it is such a wasted opportunity. And... Yes, it's their first carrier. Yes, you can make all the defences of it you want to. And yes, its biggest impact on the Royal Navy would have been by far the effect it would have had on operations for fear of its capability potentiality than 
its actual real world capability because the Royal Navy would have to presume its assessments on it being as capable as one of their carriers, as viable as one of their carriers, and they probably would have marked it out because of its size as the capability of Ark Royal. And so would have treated as such, and so would have prioritised targeting as such. And that would have affected Royal Navy deployments. It might have affected carrier availability in the Mediterranean, it could have affected carrier availability elsewhere in the world, world depending on its operational abilities. It also, as pointed out, could well have affected the pause. It could have been just a capital ship, rather than a capital ship and carrier pause. In fact, let's be honest, it's mostly a capital ship, carrier and cruiser pause uh, in terms of construction. And you never know, it might, uh, by uh, not pausing the carriers, it also might not have paused the cruisers for the Royal Navy. Now, that would have slowed down... Perhaps Part marginally the the entrance into service by probably had two months on the first escort wave getting in and then put everything back consequently by two three months in terms of things like the flower class and river uh, flower class and hunt class being rushed into service but there again probably not that much as well because honestly the main thing they utilize that they cross over each other is fitting out yards and fitting out spaces and not slip they don't utilize the same slipways they don't really utilize the same engine manufacturer they don't utilize the same they don't use uh, utilize armor or, they do utilize the same guns but you're building a lot of them anyway and you're getting a lot of them out of storage so yeah its big impact would have been a, a couple month delay on some of the escorts etc probably getting in due to the impact on fitting out yards But, again, you might not... Uh, again, the presence of a worked-up German carrier in 1939 would have changed how the British were handling their carriers in 1940. It would have made what happened with Courageous unlikely to... virtually uh, unlikely to... because she wouldn't have been in that scenario. And it would have made what happened with Glorious excruciatingly unlikely because there is no way they'd have justified sending off a carrier on its own to rush home if there was an enemy carrier nearby. It would be in case of, no, you're part of our defence against the enemy carrier. You're providing our scouting and our reconnaissance in case the enemy carrier is nearby. You're not going anywhere. I know. I hope you enjoyed this extra video and um, yeah, it's a bonus Sunday morning video. Take care. Have fun, and I hope you enjoyed. And I'd love to hear more of your points. And as I said, I would like to... I will go back to William's point, because it was a very... It was a list of interesting points to make. It was. I, I said, I'm not that keen on the phraseology used at the beginning, but that's personal preference. And I can see where the case is coming in. I don't agree with the uh, conclusions re uh, reached, but... It's a way, it's making some interesting points, which I felt were worthwhile responding to, as were discussions of what the British response would be. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed, and uh, take care. And the question for this video, as I will be putting a question in, I decided I would do, is um, we're talking a lot about the impact of a German carrier on the British. In this scenario. But what do you think the longer term impact on the British would be? Because the thing is, the carrier war in the Mediterranean, etc., and even the British involvement in the Indian Ocean and all these things tends to get forgotten in the general British narrative of World War II. It really does. Toronto and Matapan get remembered, but they, the, the it's almost brushed over. Oh yeah, they're carrier strikes, but you know, the da, 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 British are not that carrier orientated, all this sort of thing. Does that change if you have a carrier battle in the North Sea, North Atlantic? Does that change? Does the British, do you think the British perception of their involvement in carriers and the historical involvement on carriers changes if Britain has that kind of operation in the North Sea, North Atlantic? Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Um... 4th of May will happen, the Battle of Hakodote. And, yeah. So we're looking forward to Patron 78, which 
should go live tonight when recording. Not on the day I'm recording this, because I'm recording this on the 2nd of May, so it should go live tonight. It didn't go live last night because, honestly, I was too tired when I got back. And it hadn't worked properly when I'd set it up using the internet at Travelodge. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and have fun.